Welcome to More Than Words, a podcast about treating the whole child brought to you by the Reading and Language Learning Center. I'm your host, Tristan, and today I'm joined by certified educational planner, Judith Bass, to discuss fostering independence and self-advocacy. Hi, Judy. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're very excited for you to be here, and we're excited to learn um, a bunch of knowledge from you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's start with an introduction. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, sure. I am an educational consultant, um, and I have a practice, Bass Educational Services, where we help students who learn differently find college placements, post-secondary placements, uh, K through 12 local to the DC area, and boarding school placements. We also do executive function coaching and academic coaching and tutoring and standardized test prep for students who learn differently. Um, we've been in practice for 22 years and we do work virtually now. We're completely online. And so we serve students all over the United States. That's awesome. So if people were looking for um, your services, what is your website so people can find you guys? The best way to reach us is go to our website, basseducationalservices.com. And we're also, from our website, you can get to our Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Awesome. Okay. So I'll um, link your website in the show notes so people can find you guys there. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, let's just hop straight into this. So we're talking about independent self-advocacy, and let's just give people a good introduction to what self-advocacy is in the first place, if they've never heard of that. Sure. Um, self-advocacy is advocating for yourself. And that may sound very simple, <laughs> but for a lot of students, especially students who aren't as comfortable uh, talking with adults, it can be very difficult. Yeah. So what we really what we say is it's comfortable being able to ask for what you need mm. and essentially speaking up for yourself. Yeah. That's awesome. It is. I feel like that's um something that students really have to learn regardless of, you know, how they operate in the school system. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that is like such a big part of learning at, in the, in school um, and really mastering so that you can, do that for yourself as an adult. Exactly. Well. And it's very important in life yeah. as you go through school into, into higher education. Right. So how do you teach self-advocacy and that independence? Well, let me give you some examples. Yeah. Um, let's say you're a mom or a dad and you're taking your child to the doctor. Mm -hmm. You have a five-year-old little boy and the doctor looks at your son and says, how are you feeling today? Typically, who answers? The mom or the dad. Right. <laughs> Why not let your five-year-old answer right. and speak up for himself? And you can always fill in the rest later. Right. But give him a chance to have his own voice. That really empowers children that yeah. you trust them to be able to speak up for themselves. Yeah. And parents just don't realize that. It's not that anybody's doing anything wrong. It just doesn't occur to us right. as parents to do that. But that's the start. That's the foundation. Um, I'll give you another example of um, a child in ninth grade attending IEP meetings. Oh, yeah. You know, I recommend attend in ninth grade and listen, attend maybe in 10th grade and listen. And by 11th grade, the child should be speaking up first and saying, here are my needs. And the parent can fill in and the same in 12th grade to prepare them for college. Right. So it's a gradual process. But the earlier you start, think about a child in a store and they need a toy. They take them to the, the person in the store and say, you ask for the toy. You ask where right. we can find it. Or in a restaurant, let your child order for herself. Mm -hmm. All of these are things we don't think about, but they really help the student feel that their voice matters. Yeah. And it's such a simple thing. Like, I loved your first example, like at the doctor, how are you feeling today? Of course, your child can answer that themselves, right? Like, but you, like you said, as a parent, you don't think about it. You're like, well, Timmy's been feeling X, Y, Z recently because right. you want the best for your child and you're going to get there, but giving them that just a little bit of the ability to answer for themselves, like you said, it's just such a great way to get started with the independence. And it also gives them confidence because right. if you always answer for them, they doubt their own ability. Right. 
And then they never trust themselves. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's again, so, so easy to do, but just maybe something you've never thought of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So let's say you're at home and you're trying to encourage the independence and the self-advocacy at home. Maybe there are other kids in the house or any, you know, any myriad of um, things going on. How do you encourage that? Sure. The best way really is to always ask your child's opinion of anything that matters to them. Okay. You don't have to be, the, you don't have to always agree with them, but you want to hear what they have to say and give them limited choices. Again, age appropriate. If you have a six-year-old and who doesn't know what she wants to wear, um, put out two pieces of clothing, two outfits and say, you can choose whichever one you want to wear today. Give them limited choices. Unlimited choices is too much at a young age. Right. But if you give them choices and let them feel that they're making a decision, again, they learn to trust themselves Right. Um, and value their choices. You might not like the fact that your daughter wants to wear two different colored socks and a non-matching shirt, <laughs> but that's okay. They'll learn soon enough in life that that's not exactly the way people dress, but it's okay right. because that's who they are. And I can tell you from experience, I had a daughter that I had to really hold back and let her be herself because <laughs> she had very different ideas than I did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I'm sure like when I was younger, I used to love wearing mitch mismatch socks. Mm -hmm. And so my mom probably was just like, well, whatever, like this isn't a battle I'm going to fight. Like you're going to exactly. wear mismatch socks at some point, maybe you'll match them at some point, maybe you won't, but at least right. you in yourself. <laughs> Yeah. And a few other things that, uh, let's say you have a child at six years old who finally masters tying her shoes and she's wow. so proud of that. Yeah. And she does that. Well, what happens when you're in a hurry a few days later to get out the door as we always are, mm. and you say, just let me tie them for you. Um, you really are undermining her ability because now she thinks you don't think she can do it. Mm. Even though, you know, because you're in a hurry that it's, it's an exception to the rule. Right. You might be better off saying, let's just take your shoes in the car. We're in a hurry. You can tie them in the car. Yeah. Think of ways to keep their confidence, even if situations aren't, aren't ready for them to just sit there for half an hour and tie their shoes. Right. <laughs> Encourage chores. Oh, yeah. um, I, a colleague of mine has four children, and she would tell them that there were certain ages they had to be to do certain things. Oh. So when her seven-year-old said, can I help with the laundry? She goes, no, when you're nine, like your sister, you can do the laundry, but not until you're nine. And then it became a goal, like a privilege to be yeah. able to do it. So again, oh. just turning things around at your feeling proud of helping the family, right? Um, putting it in that way rather than a chore. Um, but again, it empowers the kids that they're, my, we, we call it in our family, um, what are you going to do to help the household today oh, yeah. to my grandchildren? Whatever that is, you can choose, but do something. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so we've talked about kind of ways to foster this independence at home and um, some ways out of the house as well. But why would you say it's so important to foster this? It's really important for the children to gain confidence and their ability to trust their own instincts because they could be in a situation where they have to make a decision and you don't want them doubting whether they're correct or not. Mm -hmm. You want them to feel confident that if their peers are doing something that they shouldn't be doing, that they have the confidence to say to them, no, that doesn't, that's not a good idea and walk away. And that's not easy. So you want to give them an opportunity to make mistakes, take some risks, and deal with the consequences. Of course, not serious consequences, but if right. they don't do their homework, for example, or they forget their lunch, they'll know the next day that they were hungry or that they got a lower grade. Let that happen when they're young so right. they learn. And again, that's independence. Mm -hmm. And the self-advocacy is being able to speak up and say to the teacher, right. you know, I'm sorry, I forgot my homework. I'll have it tomorrow instead of trying to hide, which is what most kids do and hope the teacher doesn't know. Right. When you have a neurodivergent student who is um, trying to self-advocate for themselves in the school, what are some of the challenges that you see them face? The first one is embarrassment, especially mm -hmm. when they get a little older. Um, they don't want to be seen as different. Right. 
And so some teachers are wonderful. And I was a teacher myself, so I know, you know, it can be it can be very helpful for the teacher to say, if you ever have any questions, come see me after class. I'll be happy to help you. Right. Um, whereas the other side of that is if the child doesn't feel that connection, mm. they're uncomfortable asking for anything right. because they don't know what the reaction is. And unfortunately, some teachers will say, oh, you don't really need that. Um, oh. You're too smart to have a learning disability oh. or things like you know, I've heard from kids, um, or just just pay more attention, then you'll be okay. Oh, and geez. so when you hear those things from a teacher who's well-meaning, but doesn't right. understand your learning, right. it's very hard to, to tell them they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so again, being in those IEP meetings or role-playing with your parents, like going up and saying, Mr. So-and-so, um, I wasn't able to finish my homework last night because I had so much and I couldn't stay up past 10 o'clock, but I worked for three hours, yeah. you know, something like that, but help them learn how to do that right. and, and teach them that. But it's, it's also that they aren't believed. They, they think that the teacher thinks they're just trying to cheat and get out of things mm. because that's what they hear. You did it yesterday. Why can't you do it today? Well, if you have ADHD, that's just who woke up that morning. Right. And, and you just don't know who's going to wake up each morning, or maybe you forgot your medicine, right. but you don't want to have to explain all of that. Yeah. So it's very delicate, you know, for them. And again, if they, I always recommend, even without an IEP, that parents meet with their, their teachers and the student at the beginning of every school year. Mm -hmm. And just to meet and say, here is my daughter here are some of the things she has challenges with. Let her speak up and just have the teachers connect with the child. Yeah. And if you do that, at least the child has more um, is more likely to go reach that teacher because they, they heard the teacher say, sure, come and see me whenever you have a problem. Right. And so once they've, you know, they've kind of like worked through elementary, middle, high school, um, and they're getting that independence and they're learning the self-advocacy, how does that then impact their post-secondary education, starting to go to college and all that kind of stuff? That is really tremendous. That is yeah. one of the most important reasons to start early. Yeah. Um, if you have a child who's independent and self-confident and has the life skills, they're socially, emotionally mature. Right. The academics is so much less important about being successful in college than these other skills are. Right. There are 2,000 colleges, 2,000 plus colleges out there. Yeah. There's going to be a college for you, but only if you can live in a dorm by yourself, mm -hmm. you can make good decisions, you can manage your time, you can speak up for yourself because your parents cannot speak up for you at the college level. You're right. considered an adult. And you have to go into disability services and ask for what you need. Um, you have to make thoughtful decisions. Again, peer pressure, or even just, should I go out? Should I study? Should I go see somebody for help? They have to feel comfortable interacting with adults, okay. teachers, learning specialists, tutors, because it's all on them. Yeah. And so when I meet with families, which is often ninth and 10th grade, um, and the latest 11th grade, sometimes they haven't learned these skills and they only have a couple of years to start recognizing, have the parents teach them that it's okay to do this and that and learn how to cook a meal, right. do your laundry, how to manage money, you yeah. know, get up in the morning by yourself, take right. your meds. There's so many things that you can start early and have them do all along when it's age appropriate. Right. And it's hard because as parents, we want to do everything for our children. I mean, we, we feel like that's our job. But if we can change that around, our job is to help our kids be independent so they don't need us anymore because you don't want them needing you when they're 25. Right. Yeah. So I would say that building this is a life skill that's, that's so important. Absolutely. Well, I think that was my last question for you, but do you have anything you want to add? Well, I would just say that um, parents are doing the best they can. Absolutely. And, and 
we always look back and say, we wish we could have, we wish we had, but we're starting from where we are now. So wherever you are, from this point on, you can make some changes and that's okay because we all make mistakes and we all look back and say, I wish I'd known this. Um, but you've got the whole future with your child at whatever age your child is now. Just start now. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Judy. This has been fabulous and I know very helpful to me. It's been interesting and helpful to me. So I know it'll be helpful to our, our parents and um, families that are listening. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it was a pleasure for me too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much to the audience for listening. Make sure to subscribe and leave us a little rating and review. It helps other folks find the podcast and we'll chat with you next time.